congratulations to everyone here. You've made it out in the kind of wet and rainy morning this morning, so congratulations. For those of you joining in, tuning in at home, uh, I hope you're under a blanket and have a hot cup of coffee in your hand, but wherever you're tuning in from this morning, we are so happy and excited that you are here. Whether you are in this room, in our satellite campus, aka the gym, or at home, you are so welcome here. In just a moment, we are just going to sing together. We are going to lift up praises to God, but before we do that, I have kind of a special prayer for us to, uh, to speak this morning over these uh, these Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. So over the past couple of weeks, we have been collecting these shoe boxes, and um, if it's something that's unfamiliar to you, uh, the things that go in these boxes are school supplies and, and toys, things like socks and, and toiletries um, for kids around the world. So if you wouldn't, wouldn't mind joining with me in prayer this morning over these boxes before we send them out. Dear God, we just thank you that um, despite things being different in the world today, Lord, that we could still pack these boxes, Lord. And we just pray that as we, uh, as we pass them off in the next step of them being distributed, Lord, that um, as the children who receive these boxes get them into their hands, Lord, that they would not only see the heart of the people that packed these boxes, Lord, but that they would ultimately see your heart. Lord, we pray that the contents of these boxes would be real physical needs. Lord, we know that these boxes reach, reach hands of, of children in situations of poverty, of sickness, of violence. And so, Lord, we just pray over the contents of these boxes that they would be a blessing and that they would be of practical use, Lord. And ultimately, Lord, we just pray that, that by sending out these boxes, Lord, that it would open doors to talk about the gospel, Lord. That the children who receive these boxes would ultimately see your face. And so, Lord, we just pray a blessing over these boxes today as we, as we drop them off, as we send them out. And, Lord, we pray over the process of them being distributed. Lord, we pray over those details that they would be distributed, distributed um, in the way that you have orchestrated, Lord. This we ask in your name. Amen.
Well, this morning we get to do something that we haven't done here as a body in I think almost eight months now. We get to take communion together. 
Uh, we have done it online, but we haven't been in the same room uh, as Jesus originally had intended us to be when we do this. And so for those of you online, we just want to invite you to take part in that with us this morning. If you have juice at home or bread, feel free to grab that. Um, and for those of you that are here, it's a little different than it usually is. You can pull this contraption out if you didn't get one. Uh, we can try and get you one now. I'm not sure how that would work. This actually, this morning, uh, once I read for you in a moment, it's two parts. The bread is on top and the juice is underneath, and we're going to take them in that order. So I want to read for you this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul talks about the Lord's Supper, and this is what he says. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup and the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And if you jump to verse 28, he says this, Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. And so this morning, I want to invite you to do what Christians have been doing for thousands of years, to do two things this morning. First, I want to invite you to remember the, the sacrifice and the death of Jesus Christ on the cross for you and for me. The death that he died that we should have, that he did in our place. And so we're going to remember together what Jesus has done for us and why it's the basis for everything we do here. But it's also a chance for us to do a bit of a heart check as a church. And I don't know if the last six months or eight months have been pretty crazy for you. I know they have been for me. And sometimes in all the busyness and the craziness, we lose track of what's going on on the inside when we get so focused on the outside. So this is a chance this morning as we take communion together to do a bit of a heart check and to see how things are on the inside. And if there's anything that you need to release to God or commit to God or offer up to Him this morning. So if you want to peel open the top layer there and reveal the bread... which I've already failed at. And this bread has symbolized, ever since Jesus ate this meal with his disciples, has symbolized the body of Jesus that was given for you. So we're gonna take this individually whenever you feel ready over this next song, uh, and I'm gonna pray for it now, let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus to us. We thank you for him and the sacrifice that he made. We thank you for his body that was broken for us, and this morning we just want to give you this opportunity to remind us of this truth. In Jesus' name, amen. want to remove the remainder of the foil there. The juice, Jesus tells us, symbolizes the new covenant and the new relationship we have with God. It was written in his blood, and will you drink wine to remember that, or juice as we are going to this morning. And so we are going to do this together as a church uh, after I pray. And I want us to remember that Jesus didn't just die for us individually, but he bought and purchased us as a whole church and a new family. And we remember that as we drink from the cup. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that really was the ink of the new covenant and the new relationship we have with you. We thank you for the death that he died that we could not in our place and the life that he lived, which has given us an inspiration and a path to follow. God, we pray that you would do that kind of resurrection work and that kind of resurrection power in our own hearts and our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen.
before we sing one more song together this morning, I want to take an opportunity to pray for one of our family here at DCC. Many of you know Frank Fair uh, and Anna. They have been an integral and a faithful part of our church for a very long time. Frank is in a serious health situation right now. He is in hospital, and I won't say too much more, but he needs God's touch and God's hand, especially in this time. So if you just bow your heads and lift your hearts up with me, we need to pray for Frank this morning. <sighs> Father, we lift up to you Frank and Anna this morning. We, we lift up to you your kids, your children, our family. Father, we know that you have unlimited power. There is nothing that you cannot do. We know that you have the ability to draw sickness out of us and restore us in health. Jesus showed that there was no sickness that he could not heal. There was no situation or drama too difficult for him and nothing beyond his reach. And his arm was too short for nothing that you wanted him to do. And so, Father, today as this church, we call upon you to touch Frank this morning in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that you would protect his heart. We pray that you would protect his body. We pray that you would give him new life and that you would give him new healing even this morning as he rises and awakes. Father, we pray that you would protect him from every element of the world that ought harm him, every element inside and outside. And Jesus, we just pray for a miracle in his life and in Anna's this morning. We pray that we would hear a report later this week of the way that you touched him and the way that you have brought him a new heart in the weeks to come. And you have brought him through so many miracles. This was Anna's prayer. You have brought him through so many difficult situations and given him so many miracles. To this morning, Father, we pray for one more. One more, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
<laughs> Greg says it's the wind of the Holy Spirit, not the storm outside that's causing all of that noise. I don't know if you can hear it, but it is loud out there. If you got your Bibles with you this morning, you can turn to John chapter 17 if you want to follow along, and if you prefer to have the screens lead you, that's no problem. We'll have that for you this morning. I don't know what your morning was like today, but today I did battle with the chaos monster. Any of you fought the chaos monster before on a Sunday morning? Parents, you've all fought this battle, haven't you, on your way to church? Pastors, we fight it just about every Sunday where there are a thousand things that could go wrong, especially with all the tech that we use, and usually three or four of them do. And in the middle of it all, getting ready this morning, running around, I decided I was going to wear my coffee instead of drink it. So it was the crowning achievement of a Sunday morning before church starts. And if you've ever experienced that before, you know that that's sometimes how Sunday mornings go. But I also know that worship, as we sing together and as we pray together and as we take communion together, it focuses you in step by step to the point where you can hear God's voice. It takes all of those other distractions and it pushes them outside the room and it allows God to come inside the room that you are in. And so I hope that has happened for you this morning. I know that happens so often for me on Sundays. So let's pray together before we dive into the Word of God. Father, we, we have sung to you and we have prayed to you and now we want to hear from you this morning. Father, we just put aside the things that have grabbed a hold of our hearts and our attention today and we just set them outside the doors of this building this morning because we want to hear what you have to say to us. So Spirit, we give you permission to speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. A few years ago, God taught me a lesson on the paintball field. I don't know if any of you have ever had God teach you a lesson in an unusual place. How many of you have had God educate you in an unlikely situation? Well, I had God educate me in the middle of a paintball field, and it was a fascinating day for me, a fascinating story, and he brought it back to my memory this week as we have been working through and stepping through this series on unity. And it was the very first, and in fact, the only time that I have ever gone paintballing before in my entire life. It was only about a half hour away from here, and me and a bunch of guys went, and the field was bigger than I thought it could possibly be. It was 15 acres of field that we could use. And it was a friend's 30th birthday party, and we thought, what better way to celebrate a man turning 30 than shooting him as many times as he possibly can? So on his 30th birthday party, we showed him no mercy, and this, this field was incredible. I couldn't believe Chatham Ken had anything like this. It had creeks, it had trees, it had grasslands, it had huts that you could hide in and blinds. It even had this 30-foot treehouse that you could climb up to if you were brave enough and sit like a sitting duck or hit people below you. And I remember as you're getting suited up, you feel like you're a little bit in a movie and we made it out there as a team and our team was moving in from one direction and their team, you don't know where they are, but they were heading back and three or four minutes in, all of a sudden, you could start to hear enemy fire flying by and just shoom, shoom, shoom doesn't sound that scary until you're actually in that situation, and it is petrifying. You think that it's just a game until you start to see these exploding balls behind you, and all of us instantly, when the fire started, we hit the ground, and we started crawling like Navy SEALs, like U.S. Marines trying to figure out what was going on and what we were going to do, and it felt in that moment, all the war movies that I had ever seen, it felt cinematic. It felt like I was in one of those movies all except for the screaming like a schoolgirl that I started doing. That wasn't so cinematic. That was a little less Rambo and a little more Babysitter's Club, but I've tried to blot that out of my memory. And I remember in that moment, eventually the fear passed. Eventually I got my head on straight, and I found what I would go on record to say is the world's best hiding spot in a paintball field that has ever been. I found a series of trees, it was about four or five trees that had grown together so that on the outside it looked like one singular tree and it had a tiny little place that you could sneak in the back and you could look through all the slits between the trunks and see what was going on. You could see them, but they couldn't see you and I remember hiding in that blind just waiting like a predator for a mouse to go by, just waiting for some poor unsuspecting fool to walk by my trap and eventually one of my good friends, a guy I played volleyball, did. He started walking, he was about 50 feet away, and I sat there waiting, and then he was 40 feet away, and then 30 feet, and I, I got that feeling that you get when you know you're going to win a game, but you just have to wait a little bit longer. How many of you play cards, and you have the winning hand, and you know you're going to win, but you got to wait three more turns, and your heart starts to pound? Well, I'm sitting there inside the blind, just waiting for him to get close enough, and as soon as he gets within 10 feet of me, I jump outside, and I lit him up like a Christmas tree. 
lit them right up like a Christmas tree. In fact, when I was done with him, he would have passed for a one-man float in a Christmas parade. He was so colorful, you couldn't even tell where the paint stopped and the actual uh, shirt began. Now, in that moment, I also learned another lesson, is that you're not supposed to do stuff like that. When you shoot somebody, you're only supposed to shoot them one, maybe two times, and I got a little trigger happy and must have shot them 15 or 20 times, and each one of those leaves a toonie-sized welt if it hits on any exposed skin. And then we had a conversation. Actually, it was less like a conversation, more like a monologue, at which he said things to me that, uh, many things that I can't repeat for you this morning. He said a great many things that would make even a sailor blush, and so I won't share those with you today. And he was demanding to know who I was because I was covered by a tinted visor. Demanding to know who I was, and I wasn't taking my mask off, not for all the tea in China. And I remember in that moment, I remember, to this day, he doesn't know it was me. I remember that God taught me something that he has reminded me of over and over again, and this is what it was. Always wear a mask when you're with your friends. No, I'm just kidding. That wasn't it. He taught me an important lesson in life, and this is what it is. The most dangerous enemy is always the one that you don't see coming. The most dangerous enemy in life, in war, in situations, the most dangerous enemy is always the one that you don't know is there. And this morning, we are going to wrap up. We are going to finish our series on unity. But before we go any further, I wanted to bring us back to this truth and bring us back to this reminder because it is critical that you and I understand this if we are going to remain and stay unified as a church and unified as a family. The most dangerous enemy is always the one that you don't see coming. You see, in church and in relationships, inevitably conflict arises. We talked about this. Friction is not an optional thing. It eventually happens within families and within relationships. And when that conflict and that friction starts to happen in the church, this is what also starts to happen. As we start to think about the other person that we are in conflict with, we start to think about them as the enemy. We start to think about them as the problem. And we don't mean to do it. It's just something that naturally happens. It's a process that we don't see happening, but underneath we start to look at them and we start to think about, we start to use words like us and them. Have you ever heard people talk like that in a group? Well, they said this and then we decided to do that and then they did this and it was just a group of us and you all of a sudden in that moment you have decided in in between that you didn't realize that, that the other person or the person across the aisle, the person across the table, that person is now the enemy and somehow it's a war that you have to fight with them. And what Paul reminds us and what I want to remind you of this morning is the person across the aisle, the person across the table is not your real enemy. Your real enemy is still hiding in the woods waiting for you to give him an opportunity. Paul says our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but our struggle is against what? The rulers and the authorities and the principalities and powers of darkness in this world. Your real enemy is not the person across the table. Your real enemy is not the person across the aisle. Your real enemy is the one who is hiding in the woods, waiting for an opportunity to divide and to push you apart. And so we as a church, we need to remember this. This is something that we cannot forget. Because today, we need to remember that the sooner we realize the enemy is not that person across the table, or not that person at work, or not that person who lives in the same house as you, the real enemy is somewhere and someone else, then we can start fighting him together and stop wasting time fighting each other. Today, we are going to talk about the passage that I've been hinting at, the passage that I've been partially quoting this entire series, but never actually fully reading. Today, we are going to talk about a passage, the last prayer that Jesus prayed before he was crucified and before he ascended to heaven. This is the last prayer that Jesus prays before ever telling anyone else something or asking God for anything, and it is a powerful one, and we are going to read the third part of it today together. It is John chapter 17, verses 20 through 24. Why don't you read along with me? My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. The glory that you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. 
This prayer that Jesus prays, this is the third part, but this is one of the most famous prayers in the entire Bible. This is the last prayer, as I said, that Jesus prays before he goes to the cross. We're only talking hours or days away from all the events of Passion Week unfolding. And this here, this is the prayer that Jesus prays, the last thing that he wants to leave with us and that he wants to ask the Father. And this is called the high priestly prayer. You see, in the Old Testament, there were two offices. There was the high priest and the prophet. And the high priest was the one who represented you before God. He was the one who spoke for you, who interceded on your behalf, who looked out for you. And the prophet, on the other hand, the prophet was the one who presented God to the people. He was the one who spoke for God and spoke the words that God wanted to say. So Jesus, in this moment, he is our great high priest. And he is, he is representing us before God. And he asks God for one last thing before he goes to the cross. And this This is what it is. Now, the cool thing about this prayer, if you read just a few verses beforehand, before Jesus starts, is that Jesus doesn't just pray this prayer off by himself. Jesus prays this prayer knowing that all 12 disciples are sitting there listening in, or at least 11 at this point. All of the disciples are listening in to Jesus' prayer, and he knows that they are listening, so Jesus isn't just praying. He isn't just asking God. He is also teaching and warning them all at the same time. And I don't know if you've ever had this happen to you before where somebody prays with you, but you know they're trying to tell you something at the same time that they are praying with you. Like if someone was to pray with me and say, Dear Lord, I pray for a leader within our church, a leader who is high up there, who has three children and drives a minivan, Lord, I just pray that you would be with this leader. And in a moment you think, wait a minute, they're talking about me. You see, my daughter, she does this to us just about every dinner time at the table. She asks to pray, and when Zoe wants to pray, she's six years old, she says, Dear God, I pray that we can have all the dessert we want after dinner and watch as much TV as we possibly can until bed. In Jesus' name, amen. And when she prays that prayer, she isn't just praying to God, she is talking to me. She's a message for me, that sneaky little child. But here Jesus, in a much more serious way, he is praying a prayer, but he isn't just praying. He is praying so that the disciples hear him because he wants them to hear what he is asking God for in this moment. And so when you read this prayer that we just read, what does it ask? He asks first for himself before this passage we read. Then he asks for the disciples. But then who does he pray for, church? Who does he pray for? He prays for you. That prayer that we just read here, that wasn't a prayer for some other person or some other church. That was a prayer for you and for me and for this church right here. Jesus prays for all those who will believe in the message after he has gone to heaven. All those who will believe in the message that has been passed down year to year to year. That means eventually in that moment when Jesus was praying, isn't this cool? Jesus was praying this prayer specifically for you, for the person sitting beside you and for this church. This was a prayer for DCC. And what does he ask God for? That DCC would be one. That Dresden Community Church would be one. The prayer that he prays for you and that he prays for me, not not just some other church. This is for us and this is for us right now. He prays that we, in this room and online that are connected together, that we would be one just as he and the Father are one. That we would be as connected as Jesus and the Father are. That we would be as close as Jesus and the Father are. That we would be as committed to one another as Jesus and the Father are. This is what he means when he prays that you and I would be one. And the thing that Jesus was thinking about, his last prayer request before he died, what would you pray for if you knew you were going to die tomorrow? If you knew you had 24 hours left to live, what would you come before God and pray for must be something important, wouldn't it? It would be the things that were closest to your heart. And the thing that was closest to Jesus' heart in that moment was you and me. And that this church would be one just as he and the Father are one. And he saw the greatest danger to the church. The greatest danger to the years that followed was that the enemy would find his way in and drive enough wedges between us that we would fracture apart and not be able to accomplish the mission that God gave us. That was the greatest danger that Jesus saw in this moment. And I want to stop and just ask you a question today. Where does unity rank on your list of important things in the church? Where does unity fit? If you were to think about the things that you value in a church and the things that you work for and you think about the music and the preaching and you think about the community that you're a part of and the things that you enjoy in the Bible study, when you stack all those things up, where does unity rank on that list? I think for a lot of us it ranks somewhere in the middle. Maybe if it makes the list at all, we think it's kind of important, but you know there are other more important things. When Jesus is praying for you and me before he goes to the cross, this was the number one thing he was praying for. The unity of this church and every single other one. Now I want you to listen closely as to why Jesus prays this prayer because I am convinced the majority of us don't understand why Jesus asked the Father for this. 
Why does Jesus ask the Father for unity? It was not so that you and I could enjoy each other's company, even though I do enjoy your company. Turn to the person beside you and say, I enjoy your company. See, that's good. Even if you didn't mean that, I appreciate you saying it. That is good for us to enjoy each other and to be a community together, but that is not why Jesus prayed this prayer. Jesus did not pray this prayer so that we would have more effective potluck dinners together or so that we would even be more effective as a church. Jesus prays this prayer very specifically for a significant reason, and he says this. This was a huge revelation for me. He prays for us, may they also be in us so that, so that the world may believe that you have sent me, so that the world may believe that you had sent me. The world. Who is the world? That is not us in here. That is everybody else out there. This is the church in the Bible. That is the world. And Jesus prays that we would be one, not just so that we would be connected, but so that those out there, that they would believe that Jesus was on the mission that God sent him on. Listen to it again. Two verses later, Jesus nearly repeats himself again. He says, may they be also in us May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and that you have loved them. That the world will know that you have sent me and that you have loved them. And what I think the church has missed for so long, and I think what I have missed for so long is this, is that unity isn't just for us in here. The truth is, unity is for them out there too. Do you understand what that means? Unity isn't just for you and I to enjoy and hear. Unity has a purpose that goes way beyond our enjoyment, our connection, or our satisfaction. The unity and unbroken shoulder-to-shoulder nature of the church is not just for us in here. It is for everybody else out there who is watching in and looking at us and wondering who this Jesus is that we say we follow. Wondering why we read this book all the time and say that it makes a difference in our lives. They are watching us from the outside in, and one of the things that they are looking for is this thing called unity. You see, unity is a symbol and it is a sign and it is proof that Jesus really was who he said he was and that he did what he came to do. I want you to think just for a second about Jesus' disciples. Think about the entourage that he rolled with. If Jesus could take a zealot and a tax collector, if he could take Simon and Matthew, two sworn enemies, a revolutionary and a man of the Roman government who squeezes people for every last dime they have, if he can take those two people and make them one, then there must be some kind of miracle happening in this group. If he can take the sons of thunder who offended every single person that crossed their paths and probably each other every single day, and he can make them one, then there must be something going on in this group of followers of Jesus. If he can take Peter, shoot first and ask questions later, Peter, run your mouth and figure it out afterwards, Peter, if he can make this ragtag group of different people one, then there must be something going on here because he can bind them together in a way that the world will be so amazed and they will listen when we say that Jesus has died for them. You see, unity itself is actually a miracle inside of us. It is the miracle of unity that the world outside looks in to see if we really believe what we say we believe. Now, I've done a lot of evangelism styles in my life. You can even take courses of all different ways to do this. The word evangelism, do you know what it means? Ultimately, it means the good news, and it means sharing the good news with other people. So I have done friendship evangelism. Anybody else done friendship evangelism out there? It's where you share the good news of Jesus with one of your friends or you invite them to church. I have done preaching evangelism like I am doing right now, telling people the good news about who Jesus was and why he died for them and why they can have a relationship with him. I have done sports evangelism. You name it, the type of sport I have done. it. I have done camp evangelism. I have done apologetic evangelism where you try and show the reason why you believe the things that you believe so that a person doesn't feel like they have to let go of their reason in order to follow Jesus. I have done internet evangelism. I even did drama evangelism a few years ago. Somebody in this church talked me into being Jesus in a major dramatic production, and I still don't know how they did it. But we managed to tell the story of Jesus in a drama with hundreds of people that came in, and probably the most unusual form is I have done mime evangelism. Do you believe me? You don't look like you believe me. I have actually done mime evangelism. I'm a little ashamed of it. But years ago, when I was on a mission strip and we were down in Fresno, California, we did street theater for people who were walking by just to see. And no, if you're wondering, there are no pictures. And if there were, I would never show you anyways. I have done all sorts of different kinds of evangelism, but unity evangelism? Who ever heard of that? 
See, we don't talk about this enough in the church because we are too busy dividing off into our different groups. But in the Bible, according to Jesus, one of the most powerful forms of sharing your faith with other people is how you treat the other person in this room and how together we stay as a body of Christ. That is one of the most foundational and effective ways to prove that Jesus really was who he said he was. And right here and right now, Jesus says that them out there, those that are watching, those that might be listening online but haven't yet made a decision to follow Jesus, they will believe in him if you and I can demonstrate that we have become one as a body, that it will be a sign and a symbol, it will be power and proof that Jesus actually loves them. And it made me wonder after all of this research this week, where was this class in Bible college? You see, we don't talk about this enough, but unity is your way of telling those out there that Jesus is real and he loves them and there is something here that God wants to do in their lives and in their heart. So let me ask you a question this morning. How many of you know somebody that you want to come to know Jesus? How many of you know somebody that you care about, maybe it's a family member or a friend that you want to come to know Jesus? How many of you know a neighbor or somebody that you work with, a coworker that you know they need the Lord? How many of you know somebody in your life that you deeply want them to come to follow Jesus? How many of you in here, church? If you have those people in your life, I want you to hear me this morning that one of the best ways, according to Jesus, one of the best ways for them to come to know that is for you to stay united as a body in this building right here and right now. One of the best ways that you can demonstrate to them that this is real is not to allow division, not to allow wedge issues to drive you apart, not to allow gossip to push space between you and the person sitting in the pew beside you, to demonstrate to them that God has made us one and he is offering to make them one too. You see, the gospel, it, it works in two directions. Two directions. There is a vertical element to the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and there is a horizontal element to the good news of Jesus. There are two promises that God makes and that Paul makes and that I am making to you this morning that if you want, you can reach out and that you can have, is that if you believe in Jesus, you can dramatically change, in fact, permanently change your relationship with God. It is a vertical promise, and God is offering you a completely new relationship with him. It runs on the vertical axis, and your sins can be forgiven, your past can be forgotten, all that stuff that you want to leave behind in life, you can actually leave behind and never pick up again. There is a new life and a new future that is awaiting for you, and there is love and acceptance and purpose in your life where there only used to be static and longing and distance. This is the offer. This is the promise that Jesus makes to every single one of you is that it completely can change your relationship with God vertically. But you know what? There is another promise that the gospel makes, and it is a horizontal promise. Jesus doesn't just promise a new relationship with God. He promises a new relationship with the other people in your life. Healed relationships, a new family, a way to go forward with a common purpose and a common goal and to fight the good fight together. He promises a new set of relationships and a shared life and a shared mission. And in this prayer that Jesus prays, the high priestly prayer right at the end, the last thing he prays before he goes to the cross, Jesus is trying to tell us this. What he's telling us is this, how are they going to believe us about this if they don't see this? How are they going to believe us when we promise them that God can remake their relationship with him if we haven't remade our relationships with each other? How are they going to believe us about this promise of the gospel if we aren't living this one? One of the things that we can do in the church, one of the practical things that we can do is that we can clean up conflict quickly if it ever happens or it ever crops up within the church. I'm sure you're all incredibly likable people and nobody ever is mad at you. So this is for all the other people out there that need to hear this. But if you ever get into any kind of conflict whatsoever within the church, even if it's something that you feel passionately about, even if it's one of those disputable matters that we talked about a few weeks ago, if you ever get into conflict with anyone in the church, one thing you can do is to clean it up quickly. Because the longer you leave it, the harder it will get to make that right. I found, have you ever worked with concrete before? Any contractors out there? This is the analogy that I feel like I saw, is that conflict is like concrete. It's easy to fix when it's wet, but if you let it dry, good luck fixing it then. It's easy to fix when it's wet. You can mold it and you can shape it. If you get to it quickly, it's easy to undo. But if you allow it to harden, if you allow the camps to divide and to set in place, you're going to have to bust the whole thing up before you fix it. And what I want to challenge you with today is this. I want to challenge you to do this, to show the world out there that we are different in here. 
Show the people that you care about, that you want to know Jesus, that there is something going on inside this church, and it isn't just a relationship with God vertically, but God has dramatically changed our relationship with each other, and we will stand shoulder to shoulder no matter what happens and no matter what comes, because Jesus is real, and he loves us in here, and he loves them out there. And the way that we demonstrate that church is to show them by standing shoulder to shoulder with one another in here. Are you ready to do that? Are you ready to take on that challenge even when it's tough or frustrating or difficult? This is our last message in the Unity series, and it's my challenge to you to be ready for the conflict and the challenge that comes in the future and to realize that unity is a powerful proof that Jesus loves those out there, and the better we do that in here, the more that they will hear that out there. I want to close with a story this morning that I think is a great illustration, but also a bit of an annoying one, and you'll see why afterwards. I traveled to Israel about 10 years ago. I can't believe it's been that long, but 10 years ago in 2010, I traveled to the Holy Land, and it was a life-changing trip, and I have told you about this before. And if, if you ever get a chance to go, and you go to the old city of Jerusalem, not just the big city, but you go to the old quarter of Jerusalem, it's tucked away, and instead of concrete, you start to watch on, walk on limestones that have been sitting in place there for 2,000 years or more, and churches that have been standing for 17 or 1,800 years and if you walk around deep into the old city, one of the most famous sites that you get to is this place called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This is what it looks like from the outside. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It's kind of nice from the outside, but on the next slide, you're going to see how beautiful it is on the inside. It's an absolutely gorgeous place. Actually, if you were Catholic, this would be probably the holiest single site on planet Earth. This is where they believe that Jesus died and rose again. There is some dispute over this, but this was an incredibly important church and has been for almost 1,800 years in the Holy Land. Well, 100 years ago, this church has been in existence and in use for a long time. About 100 years ago, Christian pilgrims used to gather in this church. Several different groups of Christian pilgrims used to gather, but they had really unique services. Every time they gathered, they would use candles for candlelight and nothing else. Every single person that came in would come in with their own candle and light and walk around, and they would use that to light their way around the church. And if you're sitting there thinking, that's pretty cool, it actually, it actually wasn't because the church was full of perfectly good light switches. The church had plenty of light fixtures, but every time they gathered, they gathered with these candles instead. Do you know why they used candles? No, it wasn't Christmas Eve. No, it wasn't for ambience or effect. Do you know why they used candles? Because those different groups of Christians at that church, they fought so often about who would pay the electricity bill that the Muslim group that, that actually owned the property had to put a policeman there to guard it, and they had to shut off the electric bill because they couldn't figure out who was going to pay it. So every time these Christians got together, they had to carry their own candles because they had shut the power off on them. You see, that wasn't all. There was also another rule. You couldn't come in the church before 9 a.m. and you couldn't leave after 5. It had to be opened and closed by a police officer himself. And the reason why was not because these were normal business hours. It's because these different groups of Christians, they used to fight so often about who would open and who would close that the Muslims who ran the actual site had to take the keys away from them because they couldn't be trusted with it and have a policeman open it at 9 a.m. in the morning and close it at 5. Is anyone else irritated by this story? This doesn't sound like a story of a group of Christians, does it? This sounds like a preschool story that your kid comes home and tells you about all the ways they fought with each other. And I want to ask you this. The Muslim police officer regarding this church, if you were to walk up to him afterwards and try and tell him about Jesus, what would he say? If you were to walk up to him and say, listen, I know you believe something else, but there really is a God who loves you, who can change your life, and he can connect you back with the real living God, so why don't you believe in Jesus this morning? Do you know what he would say? I can't tell you for a fact what he would say, but do you know what I might say if I was him? I would say, well, I, when I can trust you with the lights and the keys, come back and talk to me then. When I can trust you to open and close the doors by yourselves and figure out who's going to pay the electricity bill, maybe come back and talk to me then. Church, I want you to show the world out there that we are different in here. And one of the ways that we are going to do that is by staying united and showing that we are one, that we are one body, one group, even despite our differences. And according to Jesus, according to Jesus, this just might be the way that they realize that he loves them and that he is reaching out to them. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the prayer that Jesus prayed so many years ago, and I thank you that it is every bit as accurate and every bit as relevant and every bit as needed today as it was the day he prayed him. God, I pray for us in this church here at Dresden Community Church, and I pray for every church that he prayed for all around the world today, that you would help us raise, 
Raise unity on our list of importance within the church. And I pray for this city and this township of Dresden and Chatham-Kent that people would look at this church here and see how close and connected we are and realize, Jesus, that you love them just based on that miracle alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
If you are here this morning or you're watching online, something inside of you tells you that there is a relationship with God that you are missing, and you've never actually made that choice to fix this relationship with Him, I want to invite you today to make that choice, to come and talk to one of us or email us, because it is the single greatest decision that you will ever make. For those of you that have made that decision, I want you to remember that the world is watching. The world is watching, and the way that we can show them that Jesus loves Him is how you treat the other people right here in this room. Go in peace.